Hi, everybody. It's Jay, and I'm back in the booth again with you for another sneak peek preview of this week's audiobook release here on Say With Jay. I'm really excited. This week's new release is Dreaming of Her Cowboy's Kiss. It's the first book in Jesse Gusman's Cowboy Mountain Christmas series. Before we get started with that, though, Jesse and I were talking a couple of days ago about some different ideas for things we could do for these little previews. And Jesse remarked that, you know, I strike her as a very positive thinker. And that might be something interesting to share about, you know, how did, were you born that way? How did you get that way? What do you do to stay positive? And it kind of triggered a memory with me that I actually can remember the point in my life where I made a conscious decision to be more of a positive thinker. I was a rising senior in high school, and one of the service organizations there in my hometown of Monroeville, Alabama, um, I honestly don't remember if it was Kiwanis or the Rotary Club or the Optimist Club, but I was selected from my high school to attend a student leadership conference at Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas. Now, Harding University is a small Christian college there. And truthfully, I don't remember a whole lot about the conference uh, itself. There were a lot of seminars and sessions about how to be a good student leader and um, you know, motivational type things, that, that kind of stuff. And every evening for that week, after you know, we had dinner, we would go to the school's theater auditorium thing, you know, they had the big stage with the curtain and kind of theater seating and, and so forth. And we would have a keynote address and maybe some other little things. And it wasn't unusual. You know, as I mentioned, we had like hundreds of kids there and it wasn't unusual to have a fairly large contingent of adults in the back. Um, you know, to, to attend these things. And one night, the speaker was the president of the university. And he was speaking about kind of motivational things in general. He's thinking, you know, he's talking about uh, America and freedom and opportunity and a good bit of, you know, religious belief thrown in there as well, um, that kind of thing. And suddenly, a man in the back stood up and started very loudly questioning him on what he was saying. Um, the man was, I still remember to this day, he was very shabbily dressed. He had a bushy beard. And he kind of started walking down the, one of the aisles, you know, to be heard, I guess. Uh, but he was shouting very loudly. Of course, this was the, this was the mid eighties. We weren't, we we weren't worried for our own physical well-being, but the guy was not only, like I said, being kind of loud and argumentative, he was actually using fairly faulty logic on a lot of the points he was trying to make in response to the president of the, president of the university. And for a while, the crowd was just stunned silence, as you can imagine, then slowly started murmuring, started to build, and then you hear some cries, sit down, shut up, you know, started to build even more and it started to get a little more loud and rowdy people you know booing him and stuff like that finally the university president raised his hands said, okay look so i'm sitting here talking about america and democracy and freedom and part of that is a health a part of what you need in a democracy is a healthy debate so sir if you can be civil you are welcome to come up on stage with me and you can take questions from the crowd. The guy thought about it for a second and said, okay, sure. So they brought out a microphone and, you know, set it next to the, the podium there and set up one in at the foot of the aisle there for students to line up and ask the guy questions. And it was a really interesting experience because there were some people who got up and you know, questioned him very calmly, some who tried to debate him on what he was saying. Um, some were very, very angry. Um, 
Some were angry that he would interrupt us. Some, you know, very defensive for the institutions against which he was railing. Um, some, you know, many people didn't get up to try to say anything. I mean, there were far too many anyway for everybody to say something. Lots of people standing and yelling and clapping and booing and, you know, as was appropriate for the, for whoever was speaking. Until finally, after about 15 or 20 minutes, the university president stood up, held up his hands and said, look, okay, I'm sorry, we do have to stop this because we do have other things on the program, but I have a confession. This man is not a stranger. He's actually the head of our drama department, and we've staged this whole thing. Not so much to just whip you all up into a fervor. Part of it was for you to think about how you felt about the things we were talking about, to crystallize your own thoughts about it. But more than anything, I'd like for you all to take a moment and think about what you were feeling, what you were feeling before we got started, and realize that no one here was directing you to feel a certain way. Because I want you to know, I want you to see that how you reacted was your choice. You can't always control the things around you. You can't always control what happens to you. But you are always in control and responsible for how you react to those things. You won't always be in control, but you control how you react. 17-year-old me, you know, my mind was just blown. And I'm sure it was far more effective being there in the midst of it than it is for me to relay it to you now. But it did make me realize that positive thinking is a choice. It's, it's not about attaining some kind of phony perfection. It's something you'll always struggle with. I do, certainly. I get angry. I get sad. And those aren't necessarily the results of positive thinking. Growing up uh, in the Methodist church there in Monroeville, um, I had the benefit of hearing a lot of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who was a Methodist minister, uh, and literally wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. And to borrow from him, and I'm probably going to butcher this, thoughts have a natural affinity. Negative thoughts are like a magnet. They tend to attract negative results and attract more negative thoughts, while positive thoughts are radioactive. They radiate through you, from you, and affect the world positively. And that really, I think, says a lot. Positive thinking has numerous documented studies that it is physically good for you. Um, when you engage in positive thinking on a regular basis, studies have shown repeatedly, time and time again, that it can increase your lifespan, it can lower your chances of depression, it can lower levels of distress and pain, and it'll give you greater resistance to illnesses. By the way, I do want to add just a quick caveat here about depression, about clinical depression. Having seen it uh, in friends and family, Clinical depression is a disease. It is a disease like cancer. It's a disease like heart disease. And it can't be cured with positive thinking. It certainly can help, most certainly. But if you do feel like you have, if you, if you have symptoms of clinical depression, please seek professional help. Okay. That said, um, positive thinking can make a positive or can have a positive effect on your life every day. And you can choose to think positively. And what I'm saying, by the way, is not just new agey hocus pocus. The Bible actually tells us to think positively. In Philippians 4, 8, Paul writes to the church in Philippa, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is pure, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He's literally telling us to think positively. I hope you'll give that a try and impact your own day in a positive way. Okay, now back to Dreaming of Her Cowboy's Kiss. Her Cowboy's, Dreaming of Her Cowboy's Kiss is the story of Ethan Schuff. He was, as a child, born into a horrible, horrible home life. He had an abusive father, a drug-addicted mother, and was well on his way to a similar life when he met Race and Penny Steiner. They opened up their home to him and gave him, uh, gave him a home, gave him work on their farm, and when they adopted six siblings, he agreed to stay on on the farm and be, you know, a good example for the other children. He didn't expect to fall in love with the oldest, Ruby Barclay. Ruby um, was kind of the de facto mother hen of the bunch. Uh, as the oldest, she fought the system to help keep all of her siblings together. And when they were finally adopted by Penny and Race, uh, and that goal was met, she moved on to her next goal. That was to become an accomplished surgeon. No doubt she was driven by the idea that if her parents had had better medical care, they might have survived the car crash that took their lives, and they'd be alive today. Ethan and Ruby are, after many years apart, are thrown back together on Ruby's wedding day, which turns out to be an absolute disaster. Now, uh, back in mistletoe, can the two of them find happiness and love together? Well, you will have to come back this Friday to find out. For now, here is a sample from Dreaming of Her Cowboy's Kiss. I hope you enjoy it, but do come back for the full audiobook release this Friday on Say With Jay. She laughed. I'm sorry, I can't remember the last time I walked barefoot anywhere, let alone in a river. This is fun. She giggled. Me either. He didn't bother to tell her he had been talking about her wedding. It had been a week since her wedding was called off. If she didn't remember, he wasn't going to remind her. They stopped and just enjoyed the water running over their legs, the sound soothing in their ears. There was something beautiful about the music that water made over rocks and the scent of the river, the sweet coolness on a warm day. Of course, all of that paled in comparison to the fact that Ruby was beside him. She'd changed over the years, but that was basically her developing more of the character he'd loved to begin with. He'd seen the drive and ambition. He'd known she possessed it before he even laid eyes on her, because she had been the one who had fought to keep her family together. How could he not admire someone like that? And that was still the kind of woman she was. I think I could stay here all day. This is gorgeous and soothing, like nothing I've been around for a long time. I don't have anything else planned he said, looking down at her. He wiggled his toes and loved the feel of the water flowing up and over and under his feet. He wasn't sure exactly what caused it. Maybe she'd meant to kick the water with a foot. But one second she was standing beside him. The next second she was flailing and pulling on his hand. He hadn't been expecting it, although he might have been able to keep her on her feet, except he'd had his foot up at the same time and when he stuck it back down, it landed on one of the slippery rocks and went right out from under him. He was pretty sure she would have landed in the water without his help, but he definitely made her end up there a little faster, since he went down before she did. Their linked hands yanked her down with him. The water wasn't deep, but they made a pretty big splash as they went down in it, both of them laughing, because what else was there to do? No point in getting upset. Although he hadn't brought extra clothes, and he was pretty sure she hadn't either. 
The water wasn't as shockingly cold as he expected, and he didn't pop right back up. Neither did she. Are you okay? He asked as he leaned on his side and looked at her. I am. I'd say my pride is bruised, but I'm pretty sure you dragged me down. Although, I'm the one who lost my balance first, which threw you off. I can take the blame for it. I know I hit the water first. Then I could have let go of your hand, but he just hadn't. Her cheeks glowed, her eyes sparkled, and her hair wasn't completely wet, although it did have darker streaks where it had gotten splashed. She was glowing and happy, her smile wide and contagious, and his heart stuttered and lurched. His hand, which had never let go of hers, tightened, and longing pulled through his chest, tight and strong, and he wished with everything he had that being with Ruby wasn't impossible. Water droplets sparkled on her eyelashes. Ethan lifted his hand up to brush away some of the water that trailed down her cheek, seeing his rough finger against her soft skin, surprised when her eyes fluttered and her lashes rested against her cheek. Maybe him touching her was okay, and he wanted to slide his hand around her chin and push his fingers into her hair, but his hand was wet, and it was ruby, and nothing could come of this. But he could enjoy being friends with her. He didn't want to make the friendship awkward because he reached for more than he knew he could have. Ethan? She breathed. Hmm? He said, barely daring to move not wanting the moment, whatever it was, to end, as the water flowed around them in a world that had shrunk to just Ruby and him. His fingers on her face, her hand clasped in his. No one has ever measured up to you, she said on a soft breath. So quiet, he almost didn't hear her over the water, and part of him wished he hadn't. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.